a very successful career, a very good husband, a very good man, throws it all away with gambling this Easter. Open my heart to sing, taking the darkness inside, revealing your light, restoring hope. Open my eyes to see, see the world through different eyes, revealing your light, restoring hope. Oh, happy Easter to you. What a glorious day. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Welcome. This is the Easter edition of RestoringHopeLive.com. Heard across the nation on XM Cirrus, channel 131, and on 150 plus radio stations on the American Family Radio Network. Praise God. What, a, what an amazing day. You know, I, I could take Christmas and throw it out the window as bad as we've commercialized it. I know it's the birthday of, of Jesus, but I just, it's getting old. You know, I'm old and it's getting old. If it wasn't for the grandkids, I don't know if I've even celebrated. But Easter Sunday, this is what it's all about. For three years, Jesus roamed this earth, asking men to come alongside him, witnessing to people that he was the I am, just as God told Moses when Moses said, who are you, burning bush? And God said, I am. And then when Pontius Pilate asked Jesus if he was the son of man. No, he said, who are you? And Jesus said, I am. And he said, if you tear this temple down, I will rebuild it in three days. And everybody thought he was talking about bricks and mortar. But he was talking about himself. So... Hallelujah. I hope today you're spending it with family or, or friends or just on your knees praising Jesus that he came back to save us for our sins. This is a special show today. Today I'm going to have on a man who uh, I really admire. And I've heard his story before, I have to be honest with you, but it is a compelling story. It's not about alcohol. It's not about drugs. It's not about sexual integrity. It's not about anger. It's not about infidelity. It's about gambling, something that most people think happens to somebody else, that it's somebody with a lot of diamond rings and gold chains, and they play cards, or they put money in slot machines, and they max out their credit cards and their ATM, and that can't be me, and it certainly isn't my neighbor. Well, the man you're going to meet today, Ken, that's exactly who he was. And I welcome him to Restoring Hope Live. Ken, how are you? Great. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Thank you very much for being here. Um, so uh, you're how old? I am. Uh, good question. 57. 50, you had to think about it, I didn't did. you? I did. Uh, you're 57. And uh, you are, uh, and if I get this wrong, you correct me, but you are an incredible writer. You are <laughs> a very successful writer. Uh, you have, uh, you're a journalist by trade. Right. But you also uh, uh, write books, help other people tell their stories, um, and uh, you can be humble. That's okay. But I've been told by uh, Burnell, a lot of people that you and I both know that you're one of the best. So well, I appreciate I, how, you being how can here. I possibly disagree with that? Yeah, especially Bob. You know. <laughs> uh, by the way, Dr. Michael Hartwig is in hey. the house along with uh, Bob Montserrat. We're going to be joined a little later uh, by a man by the name of Tom Coates, who is one of the nation's leading experts on gambling and what it does to people. So um, you uh, uh, you're in high school and do you gamble? Yes. The, the first time I actually gambled, I was probably in second or third grade, and I grew up in a little town north of Des Moines. And the big Christmas event was when the Catholic Church would have what was called the Assumption Bazaar. Okay. And we looked forward to it every year, and they had games and prizes and different things. And one of the things they had was you could play back blackjack for a quarter. And they had a big plywood sheet. And for some reason, I remember um, they had this, the Lucky Strike cigarette package symbol. Yeah. And you put your quarter in the middle of the Lucky Strike thing and uh, played. And my PE teacher was a dealer, and I love math and love flashcards, and I thought this was the greatest thing that ever happened, and it lit me up like a Christmas tree. So, and I lost all my money and went home and got more and lost it. Wow. First time. So, so just but you like had a good time gambling, though. I, I mean, loved it. it. Oh, I loved it. it was I, I just loved it. But, but you, you didn't think of it as gambling. 
No, 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 no. I thought it more of as just a math thing, but I also knew there was money involved. I wanted to win money. Right. Now, no doubt about that. Right. To a lot of people, uh, they will tell you that gambling in itself is the addiction. Other people will tell you it's the desire for wealth and money. What was yours? It's the it's the feeling that it gives you. Okay, it's the I high. Didn't, if I could have gotten that playing for styrofoam peanuts, I would have been addicted. Okay. I mean, it was it was definitely the high. It was, it was just, it was. It may have started off as I wanted to win money. That was definitely part of it. Right. By the end, I wanted to win money because it allowed me to go back and gamble the next day. It wasn't because I was using it to buy anything. All right. So it started, uh, those darn Catholics, they started. Yeah, they do. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then what? So well, I mean, it just progressed. Anytime I had a chance to gamble, I did. In high school, we played cards. Uh, I uh, discovered the Exarban racetrack when mm. I was in. Uh, Probably late in high school, early in college, and it's I, a horse track, right? Horse yeah. track in right, right, Omaha. Right. Great. I just fell in love with the horses okay. and used to drive over by myself. Did you study gamble. it, or were you? Uh, I did. You I did. I mean, yeah, I definitely like got the form and figured that out. And, sure. And I, you studied thought, the horses. What I mean by that is you studied the horses, right? And or were you just wanted to walk form. in? Yeah. The, oh, you studied the, the racing. racing so you form. didn't know the horses. You just said, "Hey, I think let's play the numbers here." And that's how. Well, you no, race. you'd look at the the race. The racing form has the name of the horse right, and their right. past record. Right. Right. So you'd look at that and say, "Well, right. I think that horse right, would be right, that right, horse." Right. Right. Okay. But it was definitely. I, and one of the first times I went, I won uh, an exact and daily double worth like seven hundred dollars into a and high school. You were hooked. I was absolutely. Yeah. I was there. I'm going to do this for my a living. Uh, this is. <laughs> Where's this been all my yeah, life? Yeah, can't cancel college. <laughs> so what were you doing for a living at this time? Uh, well, in college, I'd work summers and, uh, you know, different jobs. I worked at the state hospital in Woodward for a while. And okay. uh, I, I definitely would make earn money, and then I'd go spend it. Uh, I there were gamble couple, it. Yeah, I nearly had to drop out of college my sophomore year because they had legalized uh, blackjack in Des Moines, like up to $50, and I lost all the money. I used to drive to the Totem Pole Lounge and— Huh. Play blackjack and craps and lose mm. all my money there. And and did, did this is a it, uh, the point I'm trying to make. This is something I feel like I was born with. It wasn't something okay. that came on later in life. Okay. All right. So so um, just like I'm an alcoholic, and even though I didn't drink for a long time in my life, I know it was within me. Oh yeah. And at some point, something triggered, and there it was. And for you, it was there the same way all along. Yeah. But. You started at age two because of the Catholics. We just want to. <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm just not age two. Second grade. Second second grade. grade. Oh, I, sorry. I got at least wow, the first wow. seven or eight years. <laughs> he could walk in. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So you almost drop out of college. Is that a is that a eye opener? Uh, yeah, but it didn't make me stop. Okay. I mean, I mean yeah, I knew I, I knew early on I had a problem. OK, I, I had you know, they always say the first step is admitting you have a problem. Yeah, I would admit that I had a problem from the start. I still didn't want to stop. It made me feel too good. I, I, I just, I couldn't bring myself to stop, even though I knew it was destroying me. But, but, but d did you seek help? Yeah, many, many times, over and over and over again. I went to counselors. I went to psychologists. What, what are they telling you at that point? Uh, quit. Well, you, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. quit. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. And I would listen to them. Yeah, it's yeah. like my, my dad once said, why don't you just, and when you feel the urge to gamble, go walking. I said, I've, I've walked to Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, they, they tell you, you know, and I got medicine and all that sort of thing. And they, oh, they said, did go, offer go you. to GA me, uh, yeah, right. meetings, and I did. Right. And I'd make it three or four months, and then things would get better, and I'd, that urge would come after me, and it was, I was back. So how bad did it get really get? I mean, did you gamble everything away? And you yeah, were on a, I, got, I was a cliche. Just, I, it got progressively worse. And What kind of things did you lose? Uh well, he lost family. I mean, yeah, yeah, family. You lost your family. I mean, I, the last, the, the bottom line is, I ended up having to sell my car to pay rent. That's how bad it got. I All didn't right. know how I was going to pay rent. We're gonna, we're gonna take a break, and we're gonna come back, and we're gonna talk about what Ken lost, and how much he had to pay uh, in his life for this gambling addiction, and then later on, how amazingly Jesus stepped in and said, "I'll, I'll, I'll take that burden. I'll take mm -hmm. that hurt." that habit and that hang up from you. And you haven't gambled in how long? It'll be five years in September. Wow, congratulations. All right, this is Restoring Hope Live. It's Easter Sunday, God bless you. He is risen, he has risen indeed. I'm J. Michael McCoy. If I haven't told you lately, thanks for listening. Love this job, couldn't do it without you. Right here on Restoring Hope Live at restoringhopelive.com. Restoring Hope. 
all across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life-controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida has a unique approach to substance abuse treatment. Call now and ask about our guaranteed success program, Transformations. Change your life. Change your relationships. Transform your world. Learn more now at RestoringHopeLive.com. Here's Dan Celia with today's Stewardship Moment. I always say that our stewardship doesn't start or end with our financial blessings. Listen to Genesis 128. Fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God, for some reason, has given us some of his authority and expects us to manage or be good stewards and have responsibility for the environment and the other creatures that share this planet with us. God has entrusted us as stewards of it, and we must not be careless in how we manage it. You've just heard a stewardship moment with Dan Celia of Financial Issues Ministry, helping you plan, give, and invest wisely. For more information, log on to financialissues.org. That's financialissues.org. It's about life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups. It might be alcoholism. It might be an eating disorder. This is a Christ-centered program. And what we try to do on this program is give you an insight, a peek inside what that hurt, habit, and hang-up looks like to help you personally cope with it or maybe to help you help the one you love cope with. Restoring Hope Live every Sunday at 1 o'clock Eastern. Brought to you by Transformations Treatment Center. Find out more at RestoringHopeLive.com. The Pocket Testament League presents Pocket Power. Read, carry, and share the gospel every day. If you've ever failed to share your faith because you just didn't know what words to use, then carry the word with you. We give out the gospel to everyone we come in contact with. It's so encouraging to watch somebody actually open it and look through it. And then hopefully later, they can pull it out and read it. This is Mike Brickley, president of the Pocket Testament League. League members have found that any place is a good place to share a pocket gospel with someone they meet. Join us and you'll always be ready. Is there anything more important? Our theme for this season at our street ministry was Bible Boot Camp. The Camel Gospels of John are perfect for the packages we will be passing out at our season and carnival. Thanks. What are you waiting for? Read, carry, and share the gospel every day. For more information, call 1-800-636-8785 or visit pocketpower.org. That's pocketpower.org. Today, millions are struggling with alcohol or drug addiction. If you or people you know struggle with a chemical dependency where a substance owns you and you have other struggles such as depression, anxiety, or trauma that can often go along with it, get your freedom back and successfully transform your life from one controlled by addiction to a clean, sober, fulfilling life. Contact Transformations Treatment Center where our caring professionals will help you find your freedom. Transformations Treatment Center offers both a 12-step and a Christian 12-step program, providing healing for the mind, body, and spirit. At Transformations Treatment Center, we understand the pain. Get your freedom back. Transform your world. Addiction specialists are ready to take your call. Call now, 877-989-5758. That's 877-989-5758. That's 877-989-5758. Restoring hope, open my heart to sing, taking the darkness inside, revealing your light, restoring hope. It's Easter Sunday, 2014. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Happy Easter to you, Dr. Mike Hartwig, along with my special guest, Ken Fusen, today. We're celebrating this Easter by talking about something that doesn't get talked about very often. It, it, it's kind of like alcoholism. It gets shoved under the rug a lot, and that is a gambling addiction. And for those of us who have addictive personalities, uh, uh, it's easy to understand why maybe an alcohol or a drug or something like that might become an addiction. I, uh, uh, as an alcoholic for 20 years now, uh, recovered for four, can't understand 
uh, uh, gambling addiction. I mean, I love to play tournament poker uh, and all that stuff. I'm a college football fan, but I've, I've never been drawn to gambling the way you were drawn to it. But you, you're not an alcoholic either, though, are you? No, no not at all. You can take I, a I'm, casual drink. And, right. Yeah. I, I, I that, almost never drink more than one beer. Yeah. I, I'm just... I'm just the opposite of you, Mac. I, I, this whole alcohol stuff—it's just like that. It's like just stop, you know. Yeah. But this, this, this scares me. Really, gambling oh, yeah. could get you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Clearly, this what? is. And I and I and I've got stories in my past, and it started out very much like him, and then it goes into trading commodities, mm. and then it goes into trading stocks, mm. and then it goes. I mean, it just scares me because I know that I'd probably be living on the street somewhere. If I've was, often thought I. I um, well, I'll know gamblers who are also alcoholics, and I relate less to the alcohol, but drug addicts, I underst- yeah. I've never taken heroin in my life or cocaine, Right. but I think I know how it feels, Yeah. and it's that kind of buzz, yeah. where alcoholism, I, I'm not into, I think it deadens your senses a little more. Sure, it does. Uh, yeah, and alcohol, you know, <laughs> briefly, here's how I describe it. We're all born with a God hole, and that's a place that God wants you to choose him to fill that hole. Well, for years, I chose alcohol. You chose gambling. Matt, can I chime in? Just yeah, Tom second? Coates is here. He's a, a national gambling expert. Well, um, I just wanted to uh, chime in just for a second because the researchers that have done the research, Ken, and I think you know this, uh, describe the high that you and others have felt from this that are addicted gamblers as a cocaine high. It, it stimulates the same centers of the brain that that create that cocaine high. Mm. And the, the problem with, with that is that first high is always the best, they say. Uh, and you're always trying to get back up to that high. And, of course, that first high can't be achieved after the first time. So more and more money oftentimes, and faster and faster the mouse chases on the, on the wheel to try to catch up to that high that's never going to be achieved. So I just wanted to throw that in. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. And that's a lot of the psychology behind casinos the smells the sounds the carpet the colors right oh exactly right maybe it is institutionalized addiction and and i will tell you and i you know i could go on for hours and you don't want me to but it's the <laughs> it's the not the other areas you mentioned poker mac mm-hmm. um the fourth floor at prairie meadows that is the poker you can't smoke up there now right uh, they don't make much money and it is not an overly addictive neither is the horse race and you can't go outside and smoke cigarettes in in the horse track where you can smoke is where 80% of the revenues now come from. These uh, slot machines, and, and not the um, the mechanical slots, which we're still supposed to have and be limited to in Iowa. They have overlooked that. It's the video slots that are the intentional. They call it the crack cocaine of the addicted gambler, the video slots. I, Ken, was that your yeah, issue? It's, I started off with horses and used to look my nose down at people who played slot machines. It's ridiculous. How can right. you, yeah. Why would you play something you know is you're going to beat you? Yeah. And then one time uh, at Prairie Meadows Open Slot Machines, the horses were over, and I wasn't done gambling, so I started playing slots. And man, that it was like crack cocaine. It was now yeah, well, because normally the 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 uh, is, the. Eval- the the evolution of the addicted gambler used to be able to take a, you know a year or so. Now one weekend, yeah. they they can go from a, a casual nothing to an a hardcore pathological gambler, and that's because of these video slots, institutionalized addiction. Yeah, part of my PhD is I did a research piece on it. It, it took a whole semester long. I headed up a, a whole team of people that went into one of the casinos in Chicagoland, and uh, we interviewed people in the process of it and learned a ton of stuff, learned how to really, the, the odds on all the games and uh, figured out all the games and what what was really going on behind the scenes. And the conclusion of our study was is that, uh, and we even interviewed the owners and, and the managers of all that, and uh, the conclusion of the matter is the whole thing is set up to give the ambiance that you're a winner. So from the time that a guy like Ken or me would walk in, they want to present this this thing that you're a winner. So if, it, if that theory proved true, we should be able to walk up to anybody and say, how are you doing? Are you up or are you down? Majority, 90% of the people that we asked that question to said, oh, no, I'm up. (laughs) And then we'd follow them around and watch them lose thousands of dollars, come up and send somebody else up to them. Hey, are you up today or are you down? Oh, no, I'm up. Well, I lost a little bit, but overall, I'm up. And the whole thing is just trying to get this picture that I'm a winner. So personal question. Sure. Why aren't you a gambling addict? Uh, Jesus Christ mugged me, in your words. Okay. Yeah. 
And I think there's enough of the Holy Spirit in me to say, you know, Mike, you can't do this. And, and it, for me personally, that uh, in my life, I saw some of that tendency from my father, which is another story in and of itself. But then, uh, so I, I got away from it. Besides that, good Baptist boys don't go down the casino, <laughs> you know. But they'll play the stock market yeah. or they'll play commodities because commodities have a much dr more dramatic. And uh, so sort of like what Ken's story is here, you know, I try to study it and try to give logicalness to it. But if you're not a farmer, it's, it's nothing more than a crapshoot. I mean, yeah. that's what it is. And you get that high. I'll never forget the day I made $700, seven or $800 on wheat. And then the next day, lose $1,000 on um, ba uh, pig bellies. What year was know? that have been that you were doing that? We, we should probably talk afterwards. It sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> what years were those? Oh, man, I can't remember. You're talking about 70s, 80s? It was probably in the late 80s. Early nineties. I was a commodity broker in the seventies. Oh, 80s. really? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we are. And I don't think you <laughs> knew you? that. <laughs> Merrill Lynch most of the time. Oh yeah, I, they were too highbrow for me. <laughs> <laughs> Ken Fusen is our guest today. It's an Easter really? Sunday, yeah. twenty fourteen, and uh, we're talking about the addiction of gambling. Uh, and y y Michael asked you, Doctor Hartwig asked you a minute ago, uh, what did you lose? And your answer is everything. Oh, absolutely. It just it was a matter of time, but it, as as Tom says, it got progressively worse. I had left my, I used to work at the register. At that, that's register, a newspaper. And I had left my job there to write a book. And I got an advance for the book. And I also got my pension at the same time. Uh, and I lost the book money and my pension. I was playing on the internet. I was betting horse track, uh, horse races from like six in the morning when they'd open in New uh, England until two in the morning when they'd open in, Aust or close in Australia. I was doing that every day and just thousands of thousands of dollars. And then I lost, I mean, before that, my wife had kicked me out of the house and we eventually got divorced. I lost, uh, I didn't lose my job because of gambling, but I could have. Uh, I had misused a credit card and uh, there was a possibility I was going to get fired. I didn't, but I decided it was time to go. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so in the process where you're thinking, well, I just need to win. I just need to win. Everything will be okay if I could just win. I don't think I was even, at that stage, I was so, uh, I, I all I was trying to do was get enough to gamble the next day. I wasn't even thinking long term. Wow. Wow. Really, I wasn't. I, I, at some point, I had a friend who said, what are you going to do when you're broke? Yeah. And that kind of hit me, but I didn't, I didn't stop still. So you have a friend knew that you were gambling? Oh, I, all my, I, I, if you were a friend of mine, I'd probably ask you for money. Uh. I still owe friends. I, I hit everybody up. My family members, friends, old school teachers. Uh -oh. That's fun to live with. Yeah, I'll uh, bet. Yeah, anybody. I, I was desperate for cash. Did you ever uh, get money from unethical places? Well, I don't know if you consider payday loan places unethical. But no, at one point, well, I, no, I never, I, I never went to the mob or anything okay. like that. But at one time, I had five different loans at five different payday places. Really? And I'd get my paycheck and pay off three of them, then go back the next day and get the money from them, and then go pay off the other two. That's yeah. how chaotic oh, life wow. was. Now, you said you, your, your wife kicked you out. Uh, kids? Two kids. Two, two boys. Two kids. And stepson. And um, was it because of your behavior, or was it because there was no money? Uh, both. Both. Okay. I think mostly by, I mean, I was not a good partner at that time. Well, I was distracted and angry and preoccupied. And okay. I mean, I mean, we know. know, we know the actions or the behavior of an alcoholic. What are the actions and behaviors of a gambling? Liar, lying constantly okay. looking for money. I would, uh, th this kind of behavior, I would find out from the bank when our statement was coming and then go home, and, and I used to call it stalking the mailman. I'd follow the mailman around town until he got to my house so I could grab the bank statement and then drive back to Des Moines and go to work uh, wow. at, during the lunch hour. That was mm. a, that'd happen every month. And so and just multiply that times 100, and that's the kind of behavior. I would take a racing ho form home, hide it under the couch, wait till my kids had gone to bed and my wife had gone to bed, pull the racing form out and start figuring out the next day's races. Wow. This is every single day. Wow. Yeah, I mean, every day and for years. Ken Fusen is our guest today. We're talking about one of life's hurts, habits, and hangups. It's not alcohol. It's not drugs. It's not sexual identity. It's gambling, something that in this country we've seemed to accept. Uh, we live in a state where there are more casinos per capita than there is in the Las Vegas in, in Nevada. Uh, and that's the state of Iowa. Uh, we'll continue to hear Ken's story and how eventually, uh, my words not his, Jesus mugged him and has now, uh, he's five years and he hasn't gambled. Uh, that's the story today on this Easter. Thanks for listening. Restoring home. 
all across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life-controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida has a unique approach to substance abuse treatment. Call now and ask about our guaranteed success program, Transformations. Change your life. Change your relationships. Transform your world. Learn more now at RestoringHopeLive.com. Here's Dan Celia with today's Stewardship Moment. One time a woman said to me that people were asking her why she was saving her money. What was she worried about? I told her to say that she was saving it for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. In Acts 1-8, one of the last things that Jesus ever said to his apostles was, you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God sometimes tells us what we will be doing, even with our financial resources. But sometimes we just need to wait. God will do a great work with what he has blessed us with. You've just heard a stewardship moment with Dan Celia of Financial Issues Ministry, helping you plan, give, and invest wisely. For more information, log on to financialissues.org. That's financialissues.org. your child is up with the alarm and ready for school each morning because missing just 18 days even in middle school will put their graduation at risk it's up to you learn more at boostup.org brought to you by the u.s army and the ad council the pocket testament league presents pocket power read carry and share the gospel every day there's no easier way to share your faith than by giving someone a free gift, the Word of God in a compact, pocket-sized gospel. I plan on giving the gospels out to people I meet. I'll put a few of them out in a truck stop, and they're handy to carry. I can give them to people I come in contact with every day. This is Mike Brickley, president of the Pocket Testament League. League members have found that any place is a good place to share a pocket gospel with someone they meet. Join us, and you'll always be ready. Is there anything more important? I have never used these gospels before, but I plan to give them out wherever and whenever I can, at restaurants, when I meet new people, even with family members. Thank you for your service. What are you waiting for? Read, carry, and share the gospel every day. For more information, call 1-800-636-8785 or visit pocketpower.org. That's pocketpower.org. Today, millions are struggling with alcohol or drug addiction. If you or people you know struggle with a chemical dependency where a substance owns you and you have other struggles such as depression, anxiety, or trauma that can often go along with it, get your freedom back and successfully transform your life from one controlled by addiction to a clean, sober, fulfilling life. Contact Transformations Treatment Center where our caring professionals will help you find your freedom. Transformations Treatment Center offers both a 12-step and a Christian 12-step program, providing healing for the mind, body, and spirit. At Transformations Treatment Center, we understand the pain. Get your freedom back. Transform your world. Addiction specialists are ready to take your call. Call now, 877-989-5758. That's 877-989-5758. That's 877-989-5758. Restoring hope, open my heart to sing, taking the darkness inside, revealing your light, restoring hope. Welcome back. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Happy Easter 2014. I'm J. Michael McCoy, and this is Restoring Hope Live, a program that deals with life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Mostly alcohol and drugs, sexual identity, uh, anger issues, uh, uh, things like that. But also, uh, we deal with some other things that some of us don't think about that people have issues. I mean, you see it on, you know, The Sopranos, or, or you see it on the movie Casino, or you see it on some of those. But you don't think of the guy next door, the dad, the husband, uh, of the guy who's literally spending everything he's got and more to chase an addiction. 
And it's kind of interesting because I was thinking about this a minute ago. You know, every day when I drank, there was some point when my body shut down. I simply couldn't function anymore. That didn't happen to you until you had no more money, right? Right, right. And that did that that wasn't necessarily a daily thing. That could be a you ran out of money once a month or something. Or did oh, you, yeah. or did, were you always going through money? I, 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 always, always, always. But I remember one time I was working in Baltimore at the time, the newspaper there, and I was uh, living in an apartment, and it was a Sunday, and I woke up, and I was exhausted. I'd been gambling all weekend, and and I just said I need to I need to do laundry, I need to do some things, and I actually almost started crying because the idea of just staying home and getting those th- things done when I had money in my pocket, I couldn't do it. It was like I've got to go gamble, I've got to go, yeah. you know, and I and I just. I couldn't resist. So you would get exhausted. All right. So uh, what finally brought you to the point? Uh, you said you, you, your wife kicked you out. Uh, relationship with the kids? Yes, no, kind of? Oh, okay. I have, yeah, okay. Okay, but back then? Oh, uh, rough. Rough. Um, what finally brought you to your knees? I ran out of money. Completely? I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I did not know how I was going to pay rent. I okay. had I had 30 days to figure out what I was going to do, and I ended up selling my car to pay rent and, buy, and getting an old cheap car. And at that point, I said, I remember I just said, okay, God, I give up. I give up. I had tried in the past. I, I had asked God for help in the past, and it would accept it for, you know, two or three months, and then I'd just go back. Now, this time I said, I give up. What was your relationship with your Creator like for that period of time? Oh, not non-existent. Okay, I and, mean, I, I wanted I wanted to believe more than I believed. Okay, I was a skeptic. Okay, um, I mean, you're a journalist. That yeah. comes with the territory. I was always the kid in, and I'm not making this up. I I was the kid in Sunday school. The, the teacher wanted to slap because I was always saying, "You don't know that. How do you know that?" <laughs> and uh, I got kicked out of a few Sunday school classes. And that was kind of my, but I really admired people who had deep faith and always have and. Those, you know, those people, you just know it when you look at them. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother-in-law was like that. And I just, and uh, people like that, I really admired. And so I, I wanted what they have, and I never thought I could have it. That was my relationship. And, but, but now you have it. Well, I said, I said, I surrender. And here's what I tell people now, that it's, it's one thing to ask God for help, but then you've got to let him. Yeah. And that's what I, I'd let him. And I, you know, and now in this, in the movie version, everything's puppies and rainbows, but it didn't work like that. It was, it's like, okay, I'm going to help you, but you're going (laughs) to, you're going to live on the edge for a while. But it was, it was weird. I was a freelance, I was basically relied on outside work. And right when I thought I was going to be broke, I'd get a call from someone who had heard about me or knew a friend and I'd get enough money, enough work to pay the rent that month. It happened over and over and over again to the point where I would just like, yeah, I, I knew, I mean. It was almost like, yep, got another one, got another one. It was like, I, I described it this way, the old Popeye com- uh, cartoon where the little baby would walk on the yeah. construction girders and right when he's getting ready to drop off, another one would swing in. Yeah. That's what my life was like. But God was helping me. And then, and, and then I, I was assigned to do a story on the Lutheran Church of Hope, which is a big church in West Des Moines, and uh, by a local magazine. And I started studying that and listening to some of uh, Mike Householder's sermons. And I heard the one he did on Christmas called Illumination yeah. about the darkness and the light. And I knew that darkness. I knew it. You know it yeah. from, from being an alcoholic. You bet. And I really wanted that light. And it just like that changed everything. Well, and I've heard you say, because I've heard your testimony at church, that, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you actually came in to kind of slam the church. Oh, I, I, I wasn't going to slam it, I, I, but I was going to make fun of it. Okay. I was going to call it the arm of the mall. You yeah. Know? And for those of you, uh, we, we this program does come live to you from the middle of Iowa, which is Des Moines. And we have a church here in town that I'm very proud to be a member of, have been there for 11 years. And it's called Lutheran Church of Hope. And it's a Lutheran church. It's the largest Lutheran church in the world. Uh, in any given Sunday, we have 14, 15, 16,000 parishioners. Uh, this weekend, which was Easter, yesterday we had, what, five services? And today we'll have four or five. We'll hit that 30,000 mark. Now, remember, there's only a half a million people in our metropolitan area. So you've got, you've got almost... Uh, 10% of the population that goes through this door. And it's just one of those, and, and I know it's been called a mega church, 
I know what a mega church is, and ours isn't a mega church. No, I feel I I've made some. It's the smallest big church I've ever been to. That's I right. made some really great friends there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. lifelong friends. Yeah, yeah. so it, th- that's what he speaks of when he when he talks about Lutheran church. But again, it, there was a surrendering element to this. Where I in the past, I always I would tell people I kept seeing that surrender Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz, yeah. and I wasn't going to surrender. I wasn't going to give up. And then finally, I was so beaten and broken, and I f- had nowhere else to turn. And I I just want to tell people out there that if you're going through something bad. You can ask for help, but let him help you. Let mm. it will happen. It will happen. The thing I try to explain to people is, I, I just told you how I gambled every day and every as every hour I could. That urge was there twenty four seven. That's telling me go go go. Uh, it's gone now. It is gone, mm. and I don't. I that's why. That's why I'm not skeptical anymore because I know I didn't do it. I tried a million times to do it. I tried even, even when I knew. I was destroying my family and hurting my kids, and I still couldn't do it. That's God amazing. was able to do it. Yeah, it's called an addiction. Yeah, yeah. But, but there is something more powerful than that addiction, and, and you and that's God and that's Jesus. And if you give, if you turn your life over to it, you'll you might find that you can defeat that addiction. Yeah, and and for those of you that aren't regular Christian uh, radio listeners, and you just happen to pop on this, and you think we're just a bunch of Jesus freaks like the uh, 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 what's the the television show where they get so goofy. Anyway, um, uh, <laughs> praise the Lord or whatever it is where those pe- pastors are just hammering away and then eventually they ask for money. <laughs> a, we're not going to ask you for money, but B, <laughs> Ken's the real deal. Ken's the real deal. Th- th- this isn't made up. Th- this is not some actor or celebrity. This is my friend, Ken, who I go to church with on Wednesdays and on the weekend. And, and I- I've known him. F- I've known of you for a long time, as you've known of me. Did you ever write any bad articles about me? No. You probably did. I did not. You did not? Oh. Well, you're one of the few. Um, I, was, I write fa- <laughs> Unless you were dying or had some horrible disease, I probably didn't write No, no, yet. no, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but uh, just please understand, when this man says to you, it was with me 24-7, that's the accuser. Okay? That, that's... It, You either have God's will or you don't. And everybody says, oh, well, there's free will. No, because free will isn't free. You have God's will and everything else. And Ken had everything else. And Jesus filled that hole. What a wonderful testimony. What a great testimony. Uh, One of the uh, specialists we have in uh, the studio today is a guy by the name of Tom Coates, and he's a a nationally accredited uh, spokesperson, and and you you walk the walk and talk the talk. You fight casinos and gambling and everything uh, that you can, and it's not because it was your your addiction or anything. You just believe that it's morally wrong for the state to to take so much money out of people's pocket. What do you call it? You call it social... um, Predatory... Well, yeah. I call it predatory. Yeah. It is inherently. <clears throat> yeah, I've, I've dealt with this, Mac. I mean, I mentioned to, to, to Michael when he was in that uh, going back into the 70s and 80s, I was a commodity futures broker. Uh, I mean, I, I saw and fed off of some of this. I, I saw some guys that were highly addicted. Uh, they, they needed to trade the futures every day. Um, when I came here, when, when the Lord, when I accepted Jesus Christ and he opened the door to come back to Iowa, I was down in Texas at the time, brought my family back and started consumer credit here in Des Moines. And uh, we became Iowa's largest credit counseling agency and have been for many years. Uh, I, they came to me uh, different ways. I was appalled when I saw what was going on with the state of Iowa when I had left it in 81 and when I came back in 87. We were already moving down this road of gambling. Yeah. And so uh, I was in 92, I was the only I went asked to go to, of all places, the MGM Grand in Las Vegas and testify in front of the National Gambling Impact Study Commission. Dr. James Dobson sat on that commission. There were 2,000 people out in the audience. And I told them what I was going to tell them, and I took pride, and there were only two people that were booed that day, Dr. James Dobson and myself. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, as a gambling, uh, a former, what do you call yourself, a former gambling addict? I still call myself, a, a meaning as a compulsive gambler. I'm in recovery. Okay. For five years. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, I didn't do it. What do you, <laughs> I know, I know. But you surrendered. Yeah. You know, you did. Don't say you didn't do that. And I understand as a Christian what you're saying, but God gives us the choice. You, you can turn to me or you don't. And if you don't turn to me, you lived a life like that. I lived a life like that. We've all lived lives like that at one point or another. But you dropped to your knee and said, I'm done. I give you my proxy. Here's my will. Do with it what you will. 
So you, you right? But I feel I always feel like when somebody pats you on the back, I always it's like, well, you know, I want to give God the glory. That's what I'm trying to say. I know, yeah. and, and, and I appreciate appropriate. that. It's yeah. appropriate. It is appropriate. And, and in our business, Mac, uh, I've always said for many many years that 10 percent of our uh, counseling that we do with people that are burdened with debt uh, come from people that are addicted gamblers, and it's people like Ken that come in. Ken, you mentioned the payday lenders, the, the credit cards, the cash advances. You know, every state has their own individual eccentricities, but Iowa was one of those states uh, that set up, and, and our now Governor Branstad set up some safeguards. One of them was that Iowa's not supposed to extend, uh, casinos are not supposed to extend credit to gamblers. And yet what they do is they bring in credit card advance machines. One of the things I was talking to them in 92 about in Vegas. And these credit card advance machines allow you without the restrictions that an ATM places upon you to advance thousands of dollars. And, and you're, you're in this time. You mentioned it earlier. You're in this timeless environment. There are no clocks. There's no windows. When you've got an empty uh, drink glass there, they're getting it out of there as quick as possible. Uh, they're getting the empty, the ashtrays emptied. So you're not reminded that you've been there. If you had, in fact, this came out of their publication, if you had to leave the casino to go out and get more money, you couldn't do it right there in the, in the environment that is inherently addictive, you would all of a sudden have an opportunity to wake up. You come out in the middle of the night, you, 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 know, you, that's, that's, you, know, you go out and get money, you go out and get a cigarette. Cigarettes are the same thing as the money. It's a means to keep them in that environment longer. And the longer you keep them, the greater the handle is for that casino. It's inherently predatory. And I, the only place in the state of Iowa that you can really smoke cigarettes indoors now is in the casino. That's right. Next th to the slot machines. I've always thought you'd be amazed if you knew how much they were how much they were bringing in every day in, in cash advances off credit cards. If you knew how much money was being taken off credit cards in a casino, you'd be stunned. They, when, when Iowa tried, in fact, this goes back, again, I know we're talking about Iowa stuff, but when Iowa goes back and the casinos sued the state of Iowa because the three racing and gaming members that one of them just passed off this passed away this last year, Brad Payton, tried to enforce the Iowa law that you cannot use these credit card advanced machines on the grounds to to let them borrow money and your personnel are facilitating, you're taking a percentage. It really is the casino doing this. They were sued by the state of Iowa. Uh, and the, the power that was there was that when they elected Governor Tom Vilsack to be the governor in 2000, and I was, my company was running the 1-800-BETS-OFF hot, hotline at that point. I got out of there because I knew I wasn't going to get my contract renewed. He fired the three racing and gaming commission members that were trying to hold it accountable mm. because, guess mm. what? His first visitors were the casinos. They helped to pay off his campaign debt, and their payback was that they would get rid of these casino uh, commissioners that were holding them responsible. So, the, and you mentioned earlier, Mac, this unholy alliance between the gambling industry and the states is what I take real umbrage of because it inherently corrupts the very institutions that are ostensibly supposed to be protecting their citizens, like Kent. Uh, so the, instead of protecting them, there, Ken, you were you were banned. You banned yourself. I banned myself from. Those. We had story after story through consumer credit of banned gamblers that fell down. They won't go back on the casino. They start gambling again. They know they're there. They know they're there with these affinity cards and everything else. They they know they're there. Only time becomes an issue is when they win a big jackpot. Uh, husband told me a while back his wife won a ten thousand dollar jackpot. They, she'd been gambling a long time. They called her in, wouldn't pay the 10000 told her to stay where she was. They were calling the police. They had her arrested for trespassing, and that went against her criminal record, which he said then later made it difficult for her to get a job. Yeah. I mean, how predatory can you be? Yeah, right, right. And, and uh, uh, a lot of people, this is Restoring Hope Live, by the way, and we thank you for listening. Uh, live on XM Cirrus and the American Family Radio Network, it is Easter. And uh, I don't know what you talk about on Easter other than retrib or, or not retribution, redemption. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go and blow that up. was a slip. Uh, but, but redemption. And, and you're, you're talking to a guy today, Ken Fusen, uh, who has been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ from his addiction from gambling. And you said earlier that you, you used to have this buzz 24-7 that you needed to gamble, needed to gamble, needed to gamble, and that's gone. Yeah. And, and I understand that. I needed to have a drink every day at 4.30 or 5, and if I didn't, my day was just messed up. And I, I, 
You know, we, we have we have liquor in our house. My wife loves to drink uh, drink wine from time to time. We have dinner parties. Doesn't phase me anymore. And before that would have driven me crazy. It's so hard for people to understand what it's like to have an addiction. It's why they dismiss it as well. It's just you're weaker. It's yeah, more right. Failing and that sort of thing. And I always said, if if I could make you feel how I felt, you'd understand it. And I can't, of course. But when you're in the middle of it, when you're in that 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 trance-like state, mm-hmm. you feel like I felt like if I didn't go gamble, I was going to die. Mm. I know that was a lie. I know it was the addiction telling me that. But that's how it felt. And you, it, it becomes so uncomfortable that feeling that you say to yourself, "I'd rather give in to it than feel it anymore." Mm. Of course, the light of that is it just makes it worse. It just right. comes back even stronger. But that's how it was every single day. And I don't, I do not. I some days I wake up and I wait for that feeling to come on me and it's just not there and it's not that's there. what i i say another prayer thank you i had a question uh you know dealing with gambling i see it different as far as being addicted to gambling and being addicted to alcohol now mac for you in the back of your mind you were afraid that the law was going to catch up with you meaning that you might get a criminal record for being arrested and driving and so forth yeah absolutely now you wouldn't so have I, I stopped drinking and driving but that wouldn't be a a concern of yours. No, my my concern is, and with a lot of gamblers, is the IRS, because you you start not paying or so you owe then more you money. you could go to jail if you're yeah. convicted of not paying your. Or bills. you know, I, I know many many gamblers who have been in positions to embezzle money, and they have oh, yes. uh, to keep get or write bad checks and that sort of thing. I was never, I never was smart enough to figure out how no, to embezzle. No, can a high percentage of the embezzlements that go on in this country are tied back to an addicted gambler. It's a huge percentage. And this goes back to what I the casino's responsibility for things. I do not blame the casinos or the racetracks for my addiction. I told you I was an addict from second grade. Yeah. They didn't cause it. But the fact the Catholics. That, the fact that no 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 no. <laughs> no, I know. The fact that that you can go into a casino and and you get these little cards and the more you put them in the machine, they're reward cards. And the more you play, then you get t-shirts or they'll send you money to get you to come back out there. It's their way of keeping track of how much you're spending. Mm-hmm. And I've known people out there I've known people who have embezzled money who have used those cards. Now, if, you, if the casino sees that someone who's not normally out there is all of a sudden betting $1,000 or $2,000 a day, why doesn't that ring an alarm or a bell where they say, we should check into this? What's going on here? And they don't. And I, and I, I think it's at some point, I think they're an accessory to what's going on. There's a this. lawsuit over in Omaha right now, and I won't maybe mention the name of the company, but they had a woman that was their uh, uh, their and their CFO, their, their their person handling their finances, and in less than three years, she embezzled about uh, I think it was four million dollars <gasps> from them, and it was the casino in Council Bluffs, and they had a personal. Uh, person that was assigned to her when she pulled up they saw her car coming in they assigned if, if she gambled too long they, they put her up in a room they had special uh, accommodations for this person they knew she was only making about sixty thousand dollars a year they knew, she had no way to to lose four million dollars in three years period of time and the lawsuit doesn't name her except as part of it it, it goes after the casino and it'd be interesting to see how that one settles out because they're saying that what you're saying ken is that the casino in this case intentionally facilitated this the theft of that money i i i know this is a program of hope and i don't want to talk about that i i mean that's i mean i think that's another issue the thing is i i really want people to know is that if they're if they're dealing with an addiction or a family you don't have to keep living like this you don't have to do it one of the things I tell people, their first meetings at Gamblers Anonymous, I say, if you, if you stop, this is as bad as it ever has to get. Mm. But if you keep going, this is as good as it's ever going to get. Right. It will get worse. But there is, there is hope out there. Yeah, I there, mean, there. There is no big payday in gambling, is there? Oh, there's many big paydays, but you gambled all right back. I, well, that's what I meant. Yeah. You don't you don't win some amount and then quit. No, no, you, no, no, you, no, you no. Don't. And that's no. the nature of it. They sink the hook sometimes with that first big win. A lot of times, uh, uh, many gamblers are, are are created into an addiction because they win that first big pot and it sinks that hook and it, it excites the brain that that's going on. Yeah. Um, you 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 look at it and maybe they advertise the machines, guys. Well, they'll pay back ninety or ninety two percent. 
Well, but the but the addicted gambler, which is half of their revenue, half of the revenue of the casino is coming from people like Ken, problem and pathological gamblers. They don't gamble where they get ninety two percent of their money back. Right. They're gamble until their pockets are empty and their credit cards are maxed out. But to go to your point, Mac, if you stood outside the casino and you said to everyone walking in, "I'll give you five hundred dollars if you turn around, go home, and not come back for a month," they wouldn't do it because they think they're going to win. Or they want that feeling. It yeah. wouldn't give them the same feeling. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not about the money. It's yeah. about the feeling. Right. I think I think that's so important yeah. for people to hear today. It's not about the money. Okay? Uh, drinking is not about the buzz. Drinking is about filling the hole. Right. Gambling is about filling the hole. The difference with gambling, and you mentioned uh, differences, is if you went and got drunk, they didn't show up with a, a Budweiser truck outside your apartment to reward you. Mm. And when you gamble, you win the very thing that allows you to keep gambling. It becomes a, even more, I get money, which allows me to keep yeah. keep going. Well, yeah. if, if a bar overserves somebody and that person's in an accident, they can be held liable. If a gun shop sells somebody a gun right. and they go out and kill right. somebody, they can be held right. liable. Right. Why can't a casino who lends money, who keeps track, be liable when somebody goes bankrupt? Well, and the tobacco companies have been held responsible for billions of dollars in, in damages to the cancer and all the, the, yeah. the lung problems and so forth. So the last one, in fact, there are some shark lawyers out there that are now starting to put a bullseye on the back of the casinos because they are, as Ken has pointed out very graphically, intentionally predatory and institutionalized addiction personified. Wow. So what's your life like now? Uh, for perfect. The, for the, well, for the last five years, it's been yeah, different no, than it's, it's ever been. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not perfect by any means. I live in a furnished apartment because I haven't been able to afford enough money to I pay I owe the IRS a ton of money okay. I've got a payment plan but it doesn't leave me much extra afterwards right uh, so financially it's still kind of you know month to month but everything's good everything is so much better I it, there's no comparison living this way I can't remember the last time I hated myself hmm. and that's a good feeling and you know that that's yeah. a good feeling yeah. and that, that's a big part of it uh, I feel um, I go, I go out now, and I f- I'm comfortable being around people, and I didn't feel that way. I felt like I needed to hide who I was and what yeah. I was doing. So it's, it's, it's just before, no matter what happens to me now, I feel like I can handle it with God's help. Before, I couldn't hardly brush my teeth. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, it was because I, I couldn't handle anything. Are you a miracle? Absolutely. I, I, think, any, I think anybody, an ad, a true addict, if you go one day without using, it's a miracle, mm. uh, and, uh, d- uh, and a true meaning of the word. I think, don't you think you are? Yeah, well, and like you, Jesus made me that miracle. I didn't do it on my own. I, I remember one time I quit drinking for 21 days, and I was so excited I took all my friends out for martinis. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? The, the other great thing is once you once you tap into that, you start seeing the other miracles, yeah. and it just feeds on it. So, yeah. I mean, Thank you. I love welcome. you. Thank you so much for being here. Tom, thanks for coming in today. I'm glad to Bob, do it. thanks for being here. Uh, next week's show, ooh, sexual, sexual, sexual. Someone who lived a gay lifestyle, who had demons in their life, turned to Christ and turned it all around. We're going to meet her. That's next week right here on RestoringHopeLive.com. I'm J. Michael McCoy. If I haven't told you lately, thanks for listening. I love this job. I couldn't do it without you. Right here on RestoringHopeLive.com. And until we meet again, do me one favor, would you? Please, just pray. <laughs>